So for this, I've got to be you for the day, is, is my understanding. So does that mean I've got to be a world expert on everything? I've got to be um, short-tempered and impatient, get everything done in 10 minutes. And whilst we're doing all that, be on the phone, uh, organising hotels, football clubs, and all sorts of other businesses. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Are you capable of that, Jeff? Yeah, I'll, I'll give it a go. I collapsed at an England v Germany game in Euro 2021, and they said to me, you need to slow down, but I can't stop. Yes! We're going to shock the world! When the business is failing, it's not performing. It's the owners of that business. It's really simple. We've got a short period of time that we have on Earth that we've got to do everything we possibly can. Oh! Sir Alex rang me and said, I think you now be unfair, son. This could be the greatest overlap ever. Over the last year and a half, I've had the privilege of interviewing some of the most interesting, talented and charismatic sports stars. From my mate and the man I used to overlap, David Beckham, <laughs> to the heavyweight champion of the world, Tyson Fury. I had three years out of the ring. Every day I woke up, I just wanted to die. But in this overlap special, I become the guest. So why have you chosen this location? the overlap. I've got to say, it's a beautiful day for it. So I live, well you'll see in a minute, about half an hour away in central Manchester and hotel football's back there and after a Salford game, if we've lost, this is the walk that I do that calms me down. And Come quite regularly then. <laughs> no, honestly, it's the one thing that winds me up most, and not winds me up, but like sort of, I, I, I go down after a Salford defeat and also, I do it at the odd time in the morning. So the people say, what do you do to relax? This actually is my relax. This walk here is my relax on this uh, canal. This is your, where you can zone out, as it were. Yeah, and to be fair, I don't think any of us have too many things in life that um, make us zone out. That's, you know, everything's dead fast, everything rolls on our phones. This is the 40 minute walk that I do that basically I switch my phone off and relax and just, it's me on my own. Well, look, this is an overlap and it's, <laughs> It's been an incredible success. What's the story behind it? Why did you want to do the overlap? What was, what was the thought process? Um, I think probably a couple of years or so ago, maybe longer actually now, sorry, it's a couple of years before we started, so probably three, four years ago, I felt as though I wanted to sort of try different things and interview people and try and do more long form content and build my own platform. It's too easy a question to say, which one has been your favorite so far? But which one? challenged you the most in terms of your role in it of the overlap which subject challenged you the most <sighs> which person yeah do you know something it wasn't necessarily the sort of what we found was once we started walking with people <laughs> that it became conversational and it wasn't like an interview it wasn't like questions and answers it was almost like a bit a bit like this now and i felt really uncomfortable interviewing you, you do it for a living so you you know you know what to do but I felt massively uncomfortable. We'd done Richard Scudamore, which was a sit-down one, which was probably the most nervous that I'd been because obviously that was that needed to be a sit-down one, I felt, because obviously well, Richard... serious questions. Yeah, that was serious questions. Then we did Harry and I was walking, Harry Kane, and we thought it really worked. He relaxed, I relaxed. Then I did Harry Maguire, which was sat back down again. And we thought I wasn't as relaxed in that interview and I probably didn't make Harry as relaxed as I should have been. Even though you know, I really enjoyed it and loved it. And I thought, right, we need to go back to get, getting people's uh, comfortable area, where they live, where they were brought up, where they were, you know, where they actually sort of um, go about their everyday life and then just go for a walk with them. And, and, and to be fair, it just, it just happened quite naturally. Where I think this, to be fair, probably has worked is that if you want to get a player's real and true character across, you're never going to get it. And I wouldn't have shown my true character on a football interview after a game for United. So you did. You were awkward and difficult. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I wouldn't, you, wouldn't, you, you wouldn't see me laughing, for instance, ever, which on Sky sometimes you do see me laughing. But generally, this interview where we had... so you, let's see, you, you, I get what you're saying. It's a more relaxed yeah. environment. It's more relaxed. You get, the, you, get, you, get, you get the character of the individual and personality of the individual across, and that's what I really like about it. You've segued into the overlap. Obviously, from your television work. I remember when we came for you at Sky to sign you, because you were a natural for television, because you're so opinionated. When you look back from how you were when you first started in punditry, how much do you think it has changed and you've changed? 
Lawrence, if you look at that first Monday night football, which now gets laughed at when the Roberto Mancini interviews, my first question I'd ever asked anybody in my life. Hello, Roberto. <laughs> <laughs> it's Gary. But I never thought you'd be interviewed by me. Um, and, and do you know something? I found in the first seven months, because Sky needed me to succeed after what happened, obviously, that, you know, Keys and Gray had been a great success for like 15, 20 years. They'd left. It was me and Ed. We were untried, unproven. Everybody, to be fair, other than Manchester United fans, didn't like Gary Neville as a football player. And they thought I was going to come on and just talk about basically how good Manchester United were, be biased towards Manchester United, that I wouldn't have, to be fair, the opinions that would be fair and balanced. So there was a lot of pressure on me, I felt at the time, and I was nervous. And I wasn't very good at it. You know, let's be really clear. I was a, I was a very, very poor co-commentator. Let's be really clear. If you go back and listen to my first co-commentaries, they're poor. Technically poor, delivery, understanding of how to do it, cutting across commentators, all the rest of it. And then the thing that I was okay with was the simple stuff, which is in the studio, Super Sunday. That's fine. Someone asked me a question, no problem. But Monday Night Football, you're getting asked a question, you've got a draw on a screen, you've got people in your ear talking to you about what's coming next. It just was all too much. But they got me through it. And then there was a big, there was a big moment, I think, about six months. And I remember driving back from an Aston Villa Man City game. And it's when, when City weren't very good, so it was a mid-table game. I remember the producer ringing me. The cold commentary wasn't going very well. I was getting a lot of criticism on Twitter and social media. And he said, Gary, you just got to relax and be yourself. I know exactly who found you. Just yeah. here in there. He said, you just got to relax and be yourself. You're too stiff. You're trying to be like the cold commentator should be. And what you find is that when people fail at cold commentary, it's when they're trying to copy someone else's style and how yep. you should do it and not be yourself. Yeah. And so but what I did, I remember the next game I did was an Arsenal game. And I threw in things like bingo time. The You're just yourself. The goalgasm came out. The Barcelona. Yeah, the, the the David Luiz line where I said about place. It all came out in that next month. They all came out in that next month. Not deliberately. You didn't think, oh, I'm going to no, say this. No, 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 no. They just, I, I just, I just thought, Joe, something. If I'm going to die, I'm going to die Go trying. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, there was a point whereby it was a, a crossroads moment, and I started doing the food references and the cappuccino references on <laughs> Monday Night Football, and all of a sudden there was a warmth started to come that I was being myself and natural. And that's what I would say to anybody going into television, don't try and copy anyone, you've just got to be natural. And to be fair, Sky lived with me for that first six months in spite of my performances. Whereas sometimes if people turn off on you straight away, you need the, the business to, that are employing you to stick behind you. And they stuck with me, to be fair. Has a player or a manager ever directly bit back at you, got and said, hang on, you're out of order, Gary, what you said, don't accept that. Because that's the role of a pundit, to give you an opinion but that comes yeah. with a responsibility. Yeah, Sir Alex ran me once about my comments on Dave, David De Gea, once. What did, he, what did he say? It was in the second season of my punditry, so he let the first season go, but when David, if you remember, his first season was a massive struggle, wasn't it? Yes. And yeah. well, the second season, he started to improve to the point whereby he became one of the best goalkeepers in the world. At the point where he was starting to, Sir Alex rang me and said, I think, you know, I got it last year, but I think you're now being unfair, son. I now think you've been, think you've been unfair. Well, that is a massive test case for you because your respect for Sir Alex Ferguson knows no bounds, yeah. but you're also, you've got a job to do. Yeah, and to be so fair... So what did you say to him? I, I said, boss, to be honest with you, I, he, he just isn't, you know, he's too slight. I, to my experience at United, where I had two giant goalkeepers, Van der Sar and Schmeichel. When we had goalkeepers that were smaller, that could be you know, Roy Carroll and Tim Howard, or it could be Fabian Barthes. Barthes. I, so I've got this thing about a goalkeeper needing to be six foot three, six foot four, and it's wrong because obviously I've seen great goalkeepers. And to be fair, Tim Howard, Roy Carroll and Fabian Barthes were great goalkeepers that probably would survive more today with the ball at the feet than they would do sort of back then when it was more physical still. So I've got this thing about slight goalkeepers that get pushed around a little bit. So he was probably right. I'd made my mind up on De Gea and then wasn't seeing the transition that he was making into actually a far better goalkeeper. So I took it on board as to say, maybe he is, improve, he is improving. I can see this data myself, but so I still would So you didn't back off because no. Sir Alex said, but you, you applied balance. No, you listen, don't you? Look, you know, I've, I've said things. I've said things, uh, Jeff. I remember Balotelli once, they, they, they lost, in a, he got sent off at Arsenal. I said, every circus needs a clown. Oh. I said, and Manchester City have got one. Something like that. And then the David, sorry, David Lewis has contacted me. David Lewis has contacted me on, uh, through Instagram. The PlayStation one? PlayStation, but then when he went to Arsenal, I was critical of him one game and he said, 
same stuff again, always me again. And I, just something, I looked at it, I thought, I, I, I don't like the PlayStation one now when I look back. I thought it was at, awful. At the time, at the time, it probably in some ways cemented me as being a pundit that was willing to put humour with analysis, with commentary. I look back now and think, David, David Louise has got a wife, he's got children, yep. he's got family, he's been a fantastic player for Brazil, he's had a great career, and that line sticks with him. So every time he gets mentioned, he gets called a PlayStation player, and I didn't want that from it. But it's like, it's like I reflect on it now as a 47-year-old. You know, at 36, 37, Jeff, I didn't care. You know, I've got, I'm Gary Neville, I've come out of Manchester United. You know, I'm basically, I can back up my opinion and you just think I'm going to go for it. And I got that to that point in my career where I, in, in Pundit where I said, right, I'm going to go for it and I'm going to be myself. But then you come out with the PlayStation line or you come out with a line... The clown. The clown line on Balotelli and you think, I won't do that now. But you can't be a pundit that goes on television... And says nothing. ...that basically gives nothing, sits on the fence... Don't, doesn't have any, doesn't deliver it with any passion or meaning. That that's just never going to work. It's got to be so, genuine. It's got to be genuine. It's got to come from the heart. It's got to be you. But it's also got to be disciplined. and yeah. It's got to be fair. And it's got. And I think yeah. So I think I'm more aware of that now at 47 than I was at 37. I don't get emotional at football matches, and I, I, I felt emotional. I don't miss my dad every day. I wish he was here more for how he would interact with our family and the kids and my mum, and that's what that's what I miss. I wanted to talk to you today, not so much about your football career, it's, it's post-football and everything else that's going on in your life, but I can't ignore football completely. Is the truth that it never actually got any better than New Camp in 99? No, that it, moment. Yeah, the, the problem is it, it didn't get any better and we all probably knew at the time that it wasn't going to get any better in terms of a single season. It was a pinnacle, it was a unbelievable moment a team and group of players that had been together for six seven eight nine years some of us have been together since we were 12 13 like 12 years and then you go and achieve that together and I get goosebumps every time I think Still? about that moment when, when I see it on social media the, the winning goal the build-up to it the commentary I, I it still to this moment impacts me and makes me feel sort of a, like a different feeling I'm not sure many people know this but I think I'm right in saying, and this is most unlike you, because you're not an emotional person, you cried on the pitch afterwards. It's the, I think that maybe a tear appeared in my eye because I just lay down on the ground, literally flat back, put my arms behind my head and looked up. I'm not religious. I'm not, I, don't, I don't get emotional at football matches. and I, I, I felt emotional. You cried on the pitch, I know you did. A, a, an eyewitness told me. I, 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 well, maybe I did. I, I never cried at football, but I think maybe a little bit of a tear appeared. But just the, the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, the whole thing. It, you, you just thought, yeah. it just release just the tension. I, just something, I love Manchester United. I'm, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about that. Yeah, I, I love Manchester United. It's, it's given me everything in my life and more. And it's magic. And to be out there on that pitch, playing for that club with that shirt on. Uh, when I think about my granddad coming with me and, and my, my dad coming with me, my brother to matches, all you know, from the age of five. I, and then that happens. On Sir Matt Busby's birthday, um, it just—it was unbelievable. It just, yeah, it would never get better than that. When you were thinking about retirement, you knew the end was coming. Did you plan for it? Did you fear it? Because you know what happens to a lot of ex-players, they really, really struggle. Yeah. How did you deal with it? Some, some people say to me, it was the biggest disappointment in your career? If I think you I think of it on a sort of a, I don't know, like a, a sort of a, a smaller level. The injury, I got, the injury I got when I was 32, and I did my ankle, um, and I was out for 12 months, maybe 14 months, and I never got back to that level ever again. So the last three, four years was stuttering, and that was probably the, one of the most difficult things because I was captain, I was flying, I was in the best form of my life, and the year after the lads went and won the Champions League. But in terms of my post-football career, it was the best thing that ever happened to me because it gave me, I had almost like a, towards the end, 
I didn't just get a cliff edge like that. No. I was aiming, you know, the mountain was probably 32, and then you come down, you come down, and you almost, if you like, can just climb down and descend slowly. But what it allowed me to do was set up all my businesses, you know, buy land, buy buildings, think about coaching badges. I did all my A licenses and B licenses and pro licenses in around that time. At that point, was being a manager on the radar? No, do you know, I, I, I knew exactly what I was going to do because you met with me a year before I retired. You were the first person to meet with me from Sky. And I knew I was going to Sky. I try not to tell people that, by the way. <laughs> and I met, do you know something? It's funny. I met with you and Barney. I remember it. When Manchester United Baker were playing Street. in a cup final. Yep. Later on that afternoon, I wasn't in the squad. Um, I think it was a Carabao Cup final that we got to in 2010 yeah, or something I remember like it in that. Baker Street. And, you know, the manager would have killed me if he ever knew I was basically agreeing to go to Sky. Yeah. And I knew I was going to Sky. I knew that I was going to do all my coaching badges and I knew that I was going to go into businesses. And I said to myself, I've got these three areas, but I know I'm going to do the punditry. And I know I've got these three areas. I'm going to pursue the businesses. I'm going to set them up. I'm going to go for it. I'm going to do the coaching badges and get my pro license and complete that, which I did. And I'm going to do the punditry. And I'm going to say, right, because I didn't quite know what I wanted to do and I wasn't quite sure. I had these three areas of attack. And I said, within the first three or four years, five years, I'll decide what I want to do. I think, to be fair, it got to the end of that four or five years where the walls were closing in on me, where the businesses were getting bigger and it was taking up more of my, t more of my time. My punditry career had gone really well and I was with England, with Roy, and people were talking about potentially could I be a manager. And I felt really, I felt really, do you know what Valencia did? It got rid of one of them straight away. Because mm. the reality of it was, was that I knew, imagine if I'd won, if I'd have won, 15 matches. So you've gone in, well there. Fact, yeah. yeah, let's say I've won 15 matches in Valencia. There's going to be a clamour for you to be a manager. And then there's a clamour for you to be a manager. You get offered jobs. All of a sudden, you've succeeded abroad, which I didn't do, obviously. Um, then it would have confused me even more. But I knew that I wanted to do the businesses because I knew that where I wanted to go in my life at the age of 50, 50 you know, I, I, want, I want a role in, in sport and business when I'm 50. I need to prove myself as a business owner, as someone who could set up businesses, who could drive profits and could employ people and manage people. And I knew I needed to prove myself in that walk of life. And I knew also that I needed to be able to communicate and do media. And so I knew that was where I wanted to go. But the, 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 the coaching was a confusion to that because I loved with England. I loved it with Roy and Ray. Um, but that fell off. And then the Valencia fell off, and before you knew it, the whole that went. And then all of a sudden, it became really clear what I wanted to do. Your personality, your character, your drive, everything, if you like, your persona, where did that come from? What shaped you as a person you and, your, and your outlook in life? I think I, I would say it came from layers of meeting people at different points in my life. Uh, so my mum and dad initially that drive to be good at sport, to be on time, to be, to, to be loyal, to work hard, it comes from my mum and dad. But then you come up to see, and then you, then you meet Nobby Styles and Eric Harrison. You have to be assertive, you have to be positive, you have to be driven. Um, you have to win every fight, you have to win every battle. That's your sporting career and that was your grounding as a but football then, career. But then Sir Alex comes into your career and Robson comes into your career and Keane comes into your career and Schmeichel comes into your career and Hughes these monsters of personalities and character who demand the best from you at all times with open, honest, accountable, responsibility, all the things you want. And before you know it, you've not only got good examples from your mum and dad, you've then got Harrison Styles, you've then got Kidd and Ferguson, you've then got these players that you're surrounded by. And before you know it, you've basically built up layers of experience that make, that influence you, then that, that inform you. And I feel I do, I am influenced by people and I can be managed and told what to do. I need telling what to do. But if I'm told what to do by bad influences, and that's the same with every young kid, then I'm gonna go off, I'm gonna go off track. I was told what to do by brilliant people. That's part of your personality, that's part of your character. But there's this um, interest in so many different areas, you know, businesses, um, social causes, politics. There's so many other things that you have an interest in. Where does that come from? This is your personality or your success isn't just because you had good mentors at a football club. There's more to it than that. Where did the person no, Gary Neville come from? The word I love most in life is relentless. And that's that's the name I, of your company, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and and because I just genuinely think we've got a short period of time on this in this earth, and I know that. And I see it more now that you've got to enjoy that time. You've got to spend it more with your family. You've got to spend it more time with friends. But do you know something? There's a small period of time that we have on earth that we've got to do everything we possibly can. But what's your life for? Your life is, to, your life obviously 
it's in some ways it's to enjoy yourself it's to be here it's to we're not we're, I, I don't get up every day i only do things that i'm really passionate about and i've been lucky enough to do that through football and whether it be through businesses now but i feel like i have to do the maximum jeff you know I collapsed at an England v Germany game in Euro 2021. I had a fit on the floor. Because? There were some people saw me. I don't know how it didn't get out, to be honest with you. There was an inquiry and I said, oh no, he just fell over when they scored the goal. Raheem Sterling scored the goal. I collapsed on the floor, I had a fit, and missed two days of, of the World Cup. And I was, I was worried. I had tests and they said to me, you need to slow down. And you know they identified problems that I've got that I shouldn't have at the age of 47. Well, is that not a major wake-up call? But then, I, that, that was my dad. my dad. My dad had a heart attack at 42. And, you know, I, 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 I wanted him to slow down. I wanted him to stop doing things. And he's 65. And the reason that, you know, I do sometimes cry about my dad, but the reason that I don't really have any regret, regrets about my dad's life is that he was out till four or five o'clock in the morning with my sister and her mates the week before. He flew over to Australia, Australia to watch her in the in the Commonwealth Games on a 24-hour flight to be there with her, and obviously he lost his life there. And had a, you know, he, he, he obviously died there. Everything he wanted to do, he did, and it was 65 years. I know that it sounds a little bit cliche, is this, but he had a he had a. I wish he was here now today at 60 at, at the age of 72, 73. I wish he was here. But then he would have had to have done a lot of things and miss a lot of things that he loved doing. And I think I'm in a similar boat that I just feel like, Brian Kidd used to have this thing, get your pace early, you can't make it up at the end. And it used to be, it used to stick with me that. It's like sprint, go as fast as you can and fall on the floor earlier than trying to think you can measure it. Jog and, jog and then sort of do it at the end. I know that's, it, it's, it's my philosophy that. It's go for it, just sprint, go as fast as you can. And to be fair, it will cost me. I know it will cost me. Um, at some point, but I can't stop. I can't stop. Can we just talk about your dad? Because you know, your dad was my pal. Mm. I loved your dad. Mm. How much do you miss him? And, and do you feel you grieved properly at the time? Because you're not an emotional person by your own admission. Jeff, on the morning of my dad's funeral, we launched our development project in Manchester at a public press conference. And I did that from nine till half 10 and then drove to the funeral after half 11. Because, I, do you know something? Did I, you not want to face it? Did you not want to deal with it? I'd, I'd flown over to Australia, so that basically, I, I, was, I was at Norman Whiteside and Denise's wedding. Um, we were at a Spanish restaurant, El Rincon in Manchester, down a I side know, street. Um, I had an unbelievable night, a brilliant night. I had one of the best nights that I've seen, saw all the old players that I used to watch when I was a kid, drinking with them. You know, I'd never been in that company before. It was absolutely amazing got back to my apartment in Manchester and I always have my phone on silent at night, as probably most of us do. But Emma... No. <laughs> Emma spotted the, flat, the, 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 the light flashing on the ceiling and it was my... And it was basically uh, my sister. And my sister, basically, she said... So I rang my sister and, and she was just absolutely hysterical. And she said, I think Dad's, I think Dad's died. So where is he? Where is he? I just went straight away. And I said, I'm going to FaceTime you now. And I just remember my sister basically behind three doctors and nurses pushing him down the corridor of this hospital in Australia. Um, and I, that image will never leave me because the last time that I ever really, to be fair, truly saw him where he may be alive. Um, I then basically got on a flight at seven o'clock the morning after and it, was, it took 24 hours to get there. And the reality is when I got there, he was already dead, but they were keeping him alive just by pumping his mm. heart, basically. Mm. Um, and I'll, you know, I'll never forget that moment. And, you know, I did cry and I, I you know, I, I cried a lot and thought a lot. And um, my dad was the constant in my life. I don't ring my mum every day. I don't ring my brother every day. I don't ring my sister every day. In fact, I ring them probably once. I don't, I don't ring them. I don't, I'm not that type of person. We see each other a lot. They love my kids, you know, and, mm. but my dad, I rang every day, two, three times a day, every day. I never, I never stopped ringing my dad. And that's gone now. That, that, that's the thing that I miss that just, I've still, there's a hole there. I've still got at the top of my favourites, my dad's name, and I never move it. And sometimes it freaks me out because just by, you know, you basically press it by mistake because you press the one below it. Mm. You know, my mum's below it. 
and I press my dad and it freaks me out. And I still think, like, you know, you still have that moment of thinking, like, oh, my God, I'm ringing my dad, and you stop. And it makes you think about it. But I'll never move him from the top of my favourites list on, the, on, on my speed dials. What do you miss the most about him? Um, it's not what I miss the most. It's not what I miss. Um, I, you know, I, I, miss hi, I miss the idea of him with my children, with girl. Phil's shade, for children and with Tracy's... Um, with, with babe, the baby Nev now, because I just know how much he adored my kids. He would literally come and pick, he would pick my kids up every single day, and he would say, he would ring me up and say, even though I, if I say I was picking them up the once a week, I do, he would say, can I pick them up? And I would always let him pick them up, and literally he would look after them, and he would go to the netball with them, and now I think what he's missed with Tracy, with, with, with the netball, and, and Nev, and Nev, I just, that to me, I don't miss my dad every day, I do miss him, I wish he was here, but I wish he was here more for how he would interact with our family and the kids and my mum, and that's what, that's what I miss. Who had more girlfriends growing up, you or Phil? <laughs> or, or neither? <laughs> I do still have vulnerabilities. I do still lose my confidence in moments of sort of extreme pressure. Hi everyone, I hope you're enjoying this episode. This is just a quick thank you to Skybet, our partners, for making this show happen. It's something I've wanted to do for a long, long time. Please subscribe, there's loads more episodes coming up and I hope you're enjoying it. Right, let's get back into this episode. Right, we put a tweet out asking for a few questions for this overlap special. So I'll just, I'll go through the readable ones. <laughs> uh, actually, no, the first one. Out of you and Phil, who is the biggest cock? <laughs> That's a very difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> right, here you go. Would you class yourself as a pundit, a presenter, a journalist, a personality, an influencer, all of those or something more? And do you still feel the pressure in front of cameras like you did when you were a player? Oh. What are you, Gary Neville? I feel very uncomfortable calling myself a broadcaster. Why? Um, you broadcast? Yeah, I know, but it just feels a little bit... Well, you're more than a pundit because you do co-commentary. Yeah. And also you provide social media content. You're a broadcaster. Yeah, it probably is the one that describes everything. Are you an influencer? Um, Massive social media presence, and you use social media a lot. No, I think influence is more to the younger generation. I don't feel like I'm an influencer. Well, do you influence people on social media? Mm. Don't have to. It's, it's not an ageist thing. Yeah. Uh, when you first started on TV, why did you wear such bad ties? Um, it was a problem for Sky, that, you know. They, they tried to get me a stylist. I was like, because obviously, <laughs> obviously I reject anything that comes to me as a suggestion. Yeah. <laughs> You're, you, you hate authority or people who no, want you to come if, if authority comes down from above, where you say, Gary, we'd like you to wear this or we'd like you to do... No, I'm sorry, let's be clear. Why? I just, I, I can't be told what to wear, how to say things, what to do. It just, it's, it's do, just do you not it, think it might be a good idea? It, <laughs> it just goes against everything that I believe in. Who had more girlfriends growing up, you or Phil? <laughs> or, or neither? <laughs> um, I don't think we were prolific. Uh, in terms of dating? It, no. I had probably more for, when I was at school, but then 16 to 20, I literally, Jeff, I literally, it was, it was a brutal thing to do, but all my school friends, I never saw again, and I never... What, deliberately? Jeff, I, honestly, I look back now and I think, how brutal must I have been and how single-minded. So I knew that basically, it was something my dad said to me when I was 16, he said, you're going to be basically for the next four years wanting to, to get where you want to get to, you're going to be on a different path to the people who you've enjoyed your lives with. You need to get on the path with the people who are going to be... Um, Take you in that journey, that direction. On the journey of professionalism, training, sleep, rest. So you think about your mates, you know, they're going to the pub, they're at university, they're at college, so literally I cut you them off. You just cut them all off? Yeah, I cut them off, yeah. Yeah, I cut them off. And then I also made a decision that I wasn't going to have a girlfriend. <laughs> That maybe you sure made, you made the decision? Maybe it was made for me. <laughs> <laughs> I also wasn't going to have a girlfriend for four years, so literally... Like I said, people look at my hair and I look back and think, like, I didn't give a f about anything like that. Literally, I, for four years, said I was never going to have a girlfriend. I was never going to do... I literally just switched off and everything was Manchester United. You are, I think it's the only way I made it. I think it's the only way... You are, you are emotionless. You are, you're a droid. 
You are, I'm being serious, I'm not joking, right? <laughs> you, you've just about admitted to crying on the pitch in Barcelona. <laughs> Other than when you lost your dad, have you ever cried about anything, ever? Not much, no. Not much. Why, do you don't, why don't you... Do you, know, do you know the most I've ever cried in my life? So, um, my grandparents, really fortunate, um, so I lost my first grandparent at the age of 31 and I was really close to my grandparents. And the grandparent I was probably most close to was my mum's dad. You know, I, I absolutely adored him. He, he's like, he, he told me stories. He had sort of World War II medals. I would sit and listen to him. Um, he was a brilliant man. He got up every single day, put his shirt and tie on. And he thankfully was at my wedding but we went on our honeymoon two days after, and two days into my honeymoon, a two-week honeymoon in the Seychelles, my granddad died, and I came back the next day. I said to him, I've got to go home. I've got to go home. So I'd literally never had a honeymoon, because my granddad died, and I cried. I remember falling on the floor, crying in Seychelles. My mum ran me up and said, Bill's died. Who's used to call him Bill, was like William he was called, but he mm. used to call him Bill. I had a granddad Bill. Granddad Bill. And literally, I fell on the floor and just collapsed and cried and broke down and said, I've got to go home. I've got to go home and literally just come off my honeymoon straight away. But that is a rarity for you, isn't it? That is a rarity. You, you yeah. don't, why don't you show emotion? Why don't you express emotion? Do you think it's a weakness? Mm. No, I don't know if it's a weakness because I am. Is it, is, it, is it still the United in you? Tough, take no prisoners. I think don't the, want to show anybody you're upset. I think the people that I was influenced by, that particularly if you're like, if you're. I don't know if you're the captain of the team, which I was in the youth team, if you're the captain of the club at United when I was for the last five years, if you're the leader of the businesses or yourself, people don't want to see you crying and, and emotion. I'm not saying, and I, I'm, a, m much, I'm really aware now of, you know, men not feeling comfortable speaking out about mental health issues mm. and about men being more open about sort of seeing psychologists and psychiatrists. That's why I speak about it now, which I did see a psychiatrist sort of partway through my career when I lost my form. And I speak about it openly now to show there is weakness and vulnerability there. And it also, I also speak about Valencia, the doubts and lack of confidence and loss of confidence that I had because this, this you, what you've just said about an emotionless person, I do still have vulnerabilities. I do still lose my confidence in moments of sort of extreme pressure that exist. But Do you also, share them with anybody, though? Is your no, way of dealing with them in no, the main? No. Keep it in? Yeah, yeah, I keep it in. But I think, to be fair, I've got the coping mechanisms to be able to deal with it myself. So I feel, that, you know, back in the day, I had to go to the doctor at United, 24 years of age, I had a relationship breakup. I was losing my form. I'd given the goals away against Vasco da Gama. I was in a massive downer after the treble. And I went to the doctor and said, I need to see someone, I'm struggling. And so that the doctor at Man United, sort of like the room of truth. That's that's the only place a football player really feels comfortable yeah. to really go into. You know, when a football player's in a dressing room with you know all those lads that they're in the dressing room with, the only person that they ever really confide in, I think, and I my knowledge, is the doctor. Buildings and development are a massive part of your portfolio. Yeah. The level that some of them are at now. Are even you surprised that you're involved? You, we're not, you know, you talked about your first house. Lots of people did their first house, did it up, put a new kitchen in, mm. moved on if they were fortunate enough to do it. You're talking about hundreds of millions of pounds of city centre regeneration. Why have you got a passion for that and at such numbers? I think the first thing is when I started, I wanted to basically go from local property developer in Bolton doing stuff that was, you know, good sizes but manageable, could do it with my own money and, you know, manage the risk. And then I, knew, I made a decision that I couldn't obviously publicise that with my football career. I, I couldn't go into sort of mainstream development. But then probably a couple of years before the end of my football career, the recession hit and I saw that buildings in Manchester where I always wanted to end up being developing were, were sort of, you know, a lot cheaper, obviously with the recession and the economic trouble. And I bought about six or seven buildings, the Stock Exchange, I had the site Hotel Football, um, St Michael's, which is the big one, which is like, it's, it's off the scale and that's happening at the moment. And then I just set this plan in place for 10 years, 15 years. I had this thing that, I'd, the big thing for me was that I hated the idea of finishing at United and just being known as Gary Neville, ex-Manchester United football player. I, I hated that, it scared me to death. 
So I always wanted to be, the next 15 years had to be, in my mind, as important as the previous 15. I know that was re unrealistic because of obviously, you know, what happened at United. But as it's gone on, it started off as a property thing. Um, and it's now obviously going to come to an end in the next four years. Not an end, but it's going to come to a culmination of these sort of big things that I've done. Um, but it's become more than that now, you know, with the university and with other projects that I've done. I now just generally want to invest. Every, I won't do projects outside of Greater Manchester now. So everything's going to be in Salford, Trafford, Manchester City Centre, Bury Bolton. Which you could argue is a risky investment strategy, all your but, eggs in one basket. I know, but I just, it's what I feel passionate about. It's where I want to be. I love the place. Um, and it deserves my money. I could put my money into London. I could make more money in on industrial parks in Birmingham or wherever that might be. It doesn't come, do it for you? No, 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 I don't, it's just, it doesn't do it for me. If people said to me, what's your skill outside of football, I would say property. It's the, it's the industry that I understand most on in terms of the, the planning, the numbers, the development risk, the, the, you know, the different sort of sectors. I understand it pretty well, you know, I've got a good knowledge being, of it. Being Gary Neville, being Gary Neville, failure is a bruise, not a tattoo. Have you in the property world got it wrong and really learnt a lesson from it. Have oh, you yeah. ever a project yeah. where, at the time, yeah. you're hemorrhaging money, it all goes disastrously yeah. wrong, but long term, it was a bruise, not a tattoo. Yeah. I put permission in for two big black towers in the middle of the city. It got 5,000 objections. The, the, the city's never added uh, uh, as many objections on any development ever. We were knocking down a historic pub that was 200 years old or 150 years old. And when I look back now, that was in my post I call them United, Sir Alex Ferguson days of. We get things done, we Charge. go for it, we, we blinkers on. Don't listen to anybody else on the outside. And then you think, <laughs> Valencia, a couple of failures in F&B projects, nightclub I set up. Oh, why the hell I set up a nightclub, I never know. St Michael's planning permission. And then you get a little bit of a slap around the face and you think, right, I need to reset. I need to, I need to, need to do things differently. And that's where I learned a little bit about politics in that you know, you've got, you've got to bring people on the journey with you. You can't just, you know, it's not just what you want. You've got to bring a community with you. You've got to make sure you tell the story. There's two other areas I want to ask you about, which is politics. Why get involved? You know that you're accused of being a hypocrite. You're a multimillionaire yeah. with all sorts of business interests, yet you're a socialist. Champagne socialist, you've been accused of being oh, that yeah. before. Yeah, absolutely. You know, what, what's socialism? Socialism is, in my mind, you know, it's basically that everybody should be treated fairly. Everyone's given a chance. Everyone should be given a chance. Everyone should be looked after. Everyone should have a house. Everyone should have an education. Yeah. Everyone should have the ability to uh, have access to health, uh, transport. You know, that's me, socialism. is making sure we've got the very basic things in life that people have a chance to succeed in. And then if you do well in those things, you can maybe afford champagne. I believe you can earn good money, I believe you can have businesses, but be compassionate with it and believe that other people deserve an opportunity and a chance and, and spread that wealth. You know, it's capitalism with a bit of compassion. Can we have a seat? I'm tired. Now, it's an absolutely magnificent day here in Manchester, but I genuinely think the sun will go down if I ask you how many problems there are at Manchester United. I can no longer even think of criticising too heavily anymore the players, the football operation, certainly not the new CEO because he's been in there for five months. It has to now, everything has to point towards the Glazer family because it just, in my businesses, if there is embedded rot over many, many years, failure in performance, then eventually it comes to the owners. You can't start having a go at the people in the business if the owners are not making the right decisions at the time. In your opinion, can it ever be fixed whilst they are the owners? I, I've, got, I've come to the conclusion now that there needs to be ownership change for the club to succeed again in the future. I was going to bring you to Hawk there because it's been, a, it's been a fascinating and a really enjoyable overlap. I hope you've enjoyed it. But as you say all that, given you and your personality and drive and... It's the logical next step. You've just got to buy Manchester United. You just want me out of sky, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed it. Come on, it's your show. You've got to close it. Well, I hope you enjoyed 
that episode of The Overlap. Thank you very much, Jeff, as a guest presenter. And we're also going to give you a little bit of bonus footage because we're going to have a camera with me at Brentford and Manchester United tomorrow. I think Jeff may be there. I'm there. And also, we're going to let you a little bit behind the scenes on Monday Night Football with Dave Jones and Carragher on Monday. So we're going to get a little bit of bonus footage. I hope you enjoy it and please subscribe. This is not work. It's like a pleasure. Just look at me when I'm talking to you. Pull the pin out of the grenade and lob it into the room. It's magnificent, the stadium, isn't it? Look at this. Wow. Look at this, look at this. And then, it's not work, this, is it, really? It's not. If someone says to me, what, what do you do for a living? It's not work. This is not work. It's like a pleasure. To be honest with you, until a lot of, a lot of our colleagues say that. Until 5.30, <laughs> when United are playing. So, what, so when you're co-com today, you're yeah. a little bit of studio later on. No, I'm co-com, and then what happens after the game, I'll come down here. So, the commentary position, let me just give you some... At uh, this... Well, commentary position for us today will be... You're sat next to Bill, yeah, just so the left the of the G-Tech. Yeah, left of the G-Tech. We're in that middle bit there, right over the halfway line. We're always over the halfway line. And then, well, after the game, I'll race down and... Join Kelly. Kelly. Jamie, Jamie Redknapp. Redknapp. And Karen Carney. Today. And this is where we... Uh, yeah, this is where we go. Yes. Go on, Brandon. Oh. Are you more nervous watching Salford or United? Salford. Can't do anything about it. <laughs> Excuse me. No barracking from the back, please. <laughs> no, because I can't do anything about United. I can do something about Salford, so it's like I feel like I'm more responsible. You can't be, you can't get nervous about something that you've got nothing to do with. But I do get annoyed with United and frustrated and angry. Oh, he scored! Get in! Come on, Salford! Oh, he scored again! Oh, he snapped, he snapped, he's gone. Head's gone. Right, that's it, that's it. Come on, let's go. We're done, we're done. Done. Phil, Phil, hi, how are we? Embuermo, Roslev. Embuermo. Embuermo, 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 Embuermo. 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 I've called him Embuermo for two years, I don't know, whatever it's been. Yeah, he's not happy. Henry, Henri, Henri. Tony. I knew Manchester United were lacking in confidence. I thought away from home, they'd be more... They'd be more you were Yeah, I thought away from home, you know, with the players they've got, they'd be more relaxed, more confident. That is a very vulnerable group of players. And I'm, I'm very nervous about, to be fair, sticking the knife into any single one of them, because I'll tell you what, they must be fragile. They must be very fragile. Football fans in this country, that shook the whole of this country. Some of them with glee, and why not? If you're not a Manchester United fan, watching Brentford, a brilliant football club, destroy one of the biggest football clubs in the world. And yet you see Manchester United capitulate on a national stage. At this moment in time, it is really desperate. Joel Glazer has got to get on a plane, he's got to get over to Manchester, and he's got to start to divert the issues away from the club and tell everybody what the hell his plan is with the football club. What is he doing? Yeah, I get that, but you can't... No, 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 you can't, no. Yeah, 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 yeah. You've had to go to the players before the break, though, Jamie. You can't keep blaming the players. You can't keep blaming the owners when players are performances you've, like that. Jamie, you've had when got, you're a player, Jamie, do you actually think Jamie, to yourself... Jamie, no, no, let me just ask you a question. You've had to go to the players before the break. Because, no, but you're saying, when you're a player, and I've been involved, we didn't win the league for 30 years at Liverpool, right? 
Just look at me when I'm talking to you. You didn't win the league for 30 years, Jamie, right? You've so only got the players well, but we went break. through it. No, I'm not only got the players, but I'm saying, but they have to take responsibility. When well, you're a player, do you think, oh, why would I do what John Glazer's doing how tomorrow? Many times, I wouldn't care less. How many times you have to do better for the team here? when you play? How many times are we going to sit here and say those players need uh, lack leadership, personality? They well, need say, to, how many times they, are you going to keep they, saying go get rid of the owners? No, but they've proven it. They've proven they spent a billion pounds on the team. They've proven they can't handle it. These players, so they needed to have a good transfer market. They've not had a good transfer market. It was He's now gone. Who's fault is? it now it's, it's always but when, when a business is failing it's not performing it's the owners of that business it's really simple thank you very much to everybody um, this evening uh, somebody suggested men against bees um, for the for the closing link but i think we'll go that this bus stop in hounslow at this bus stop in hounslow is a taxi for manchester united well i went for it I was supposed to keep calm today and relax. Sulfur put me in a good mood, and the United just pushed me right over the edge. <sighs> Pull the pin out of a grenade and lob it into the room. Hi, everyone. Here he is! Here he is! Yes! Oh, God. Don't say anything that's going to get yourself sacked, but you go as close to the edge as you possibly can. On Monday, I was at Sky Sports, just up the road from Brentford Stadium. I told Jeff to stay at home while we filmed behind the scenes of Monday Night Football. Right, here we go, we're going to do this. Although, unforgivably, I was running late. We've got your film crew here, Gary. Oh, hi everyone. Oh. Do you unique situation this? Um, in what sense? You're always late. Yeah. Right. Hang on, hang on. Should we crack on? Hold on. If Darwin Nunes is starting, should we save him for part three, or do you want to touch on the Liverpool team at the top? I think the no, I think the big news is is for everyone is Nunes making his debut at Anfield. It just feels strange to then leave it till. I mean, we still, but it just feels like the, the team is just out. Nunes a start. Yeah, and then I, I think at that point we should say basically Dave Wright, less um, Man United, Gary, and I think we should start with saying Gary. You obviously had a lot to say on Saturday. Jack, I mean, uh, it's a small point, Jack. Um, but I think this important on Saturday. Um, highlighted before the game the problem with physicality and set pieces twice in, in the close-ups and in the gantry cross that I did. I thought that it was a risk. And then after the game, uh, talked about I talked about myself being a five foot ten centre half and now the struggles that I had with it. Then, then we talked about recruitment and we also talked about Ten Hag not being used to the level yet and not understanding the league. So I know that the main focus out of my comments on Saturday was the argument with Jamie around the Glazer family, but we had heavily gone into five foot nine and a half, the physicality problem, the recruitment part of it and not getting the players in. So what, I, don't, I don't want it to feel like on Saturday, I only blame the Glazers. I think that was something that to be fair, why I suppose it got quite heated. Because in the first part we did on the Glazer, on, yeah. on United, we spoke about all the football stuff and the recruitment stuff at length and we were critical of that. So I did speak about all the other stuff. It's just that obviously after the break, we, we don't really have to go at the players, you know what I mean? Party, so analysis Chelsea first half. I'm not mentioning the word relegation with Manchester United, oh, Gary. right? Jack, they could finish. No, they could finish. They could finish 14th. No. You went down to 14th with Liverpool one season. When? I'm f you, 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 you were. I don't think that's. I don't think that's. You were. You were 14th at halfway through a season. You got this option. I don't know when it was. It'd be, it'd be, it'd be, it'd be Hodgson won seven of 20 and had Liverpool in 12. You took them down to 12. You've experienced this before. You You've nosedived a big club before, so you know yeah. about this. I'm going to rank that. <laughs> <laughs> we, we nearly got top four January, this season. 8th of January, 2011. <laughs> <20 laughs> <20 laughs> <20 laughs> <20 laughs> 
20 games, 20 league games. We lost to Tottenham with two games to go. We could have got Champions League. 20 league games. <laughs> oh, I'm going downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm leaving now. Yeah, yeah. We need to rehearse slightly earlier because you guys have got to shoot to the late. Buzzing. Here we go, how are we? Hey, going? Top of the world. I don't think we have to do it. I, do. I think, I, I don't think we really have time for any of it anyway. But just... Yes, Frankie. And get Frankie in. The, oh, yeah, let's get, oh, here he is. Let's do that curtsy again. <laughs> Frankie, the floor manager. The most important person on Monday Night Football by a street. Yes. <laughs> have you remembered your... Oh today. no, they're upstairs. I'll go no, 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 no. I'll tell you what he did, Frankie. He, he, he knew he forgot okay, for five minutes ago, no, no. but he wants you to get them. No, I don't want to get them. He's just no, pretended no. that he no, forgot. No, He knew five minutes ago, but he didn't want to go and That's get a them. lie. That's a lie. He lies, you know that. Do you know that we're going to be in an opera? Is it? Are you I am, Dave? I am as well. Dave, yeah, we're all three of us are in an opera. Have we got to sing? Yeah. Big moment, that. Are we getting paid for it? <laughs> <laughs> Who's getting paid to be an opera? We're getting paid for this. For what? The overlap? Oh no, the overlap's free of charge. Free of charge. <laughs> oh, <laughs> overlap's got no budget. Got no budget. Yeah. The overlap. Yeah. <laughs> Is Gary's graphic in the touchscreen major signings now? Uh, Dave, tell what we do. No, 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 tell what we do. Right. At the beginning, I'll say, look, it's a big problem with your drop points. We know the standards that City have set, and they've actually got a quite an awkward opponent tonight that actually last season had the best, third best record in the top six. That's it. No, that's it. No, 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 that's it. I'll, I'll, do it into that. I'll do it into that answer. Okay, so basically, this first clip is at 0 0. It's not the point partly on this one because of the clip you've shown before that, like, he doesn't have faith in Fred to do it. This is why. Right, so we are five o'clock. We've been here for five hours and we've uh, had our meetings and all you've been following us through the day. We've just finished our rehearsal. So for me, this next hour is, is really crucial because if I go back to the green room with Gary and Jamie, I'm going to get lost in gossip for an hour. I'll do it for 15 minutes, maybe something like that. But then I'll need to take myself away just for half an hour just to sort of get my head around exactly what the programme is and make sure it comes out, hopefully, with a bit of sense. What's the biggest thing you think of, guys, when you're getting your makeup? What needs to be done to make you look better? So I do two things. I always take my jacket off and put it over a chair. I've done since I started. I always bring my phone in and put it down, and I always take a cotton bud out and walk out with it. It's a weird thing, that. Because the quality of show we're going to have tonight has got nothing to do with me putting a jacket on that chair or a cotton bud, I can assure you of that. But it's just like a, it's like a routine. and It's like a routine. No, Jamie, it's not superstition, it's routine. And the other thing I think of is, don't say anything that's going to get yourself sacked. What, just in the makeup room? Yeah, that's what I have to look at. When I look at me in the mirror, I say, right, don't say anything. <laughs> I mean, on the show, don't say anything that's going to get yourself sacked. But you want to go as close to the... the as but you, you go as close to the edge as you possibly can. That's the way we go, isn't it? Mm. See, not too much makeup, eh? That's it. That's all they do. Thank you. Thank you. No, no, what's the, what's the stuff that... You... Oh, the airbrush. Uh, no airbrushing. No airbrushing here. Natural. Right, we're ready to go. Pardon? Uh, no, I'm OK, I'm good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right, and here we go. Let's get the cotton bud. There's always cotton bud, you see. Just walk out with the cotton bud. Just walk out with the cotton bud. Don't even use the cotton bud. Just walk out with the cotton bud. Ah, oh, dear. And do you know the other superstition? I'm always last into the studio. It's true that, isn't it? Yeah. Always last. You wouldn't think that. You, you wouldn't think that, would you? You wouldn't think that. You wouldn't think I'd always be last into the studio. But I'm always been last into the studio. What have you got with another black suit? Eh? Another black suit? No, no, blue, blue. Oh, we've got all. Oh. A, a, a little bit of a pocket chief. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little, little touch. A little touch. Ah oh dear. <laughs> Do you know something? No. I used to be a nervous wreck, honestly. Walking down there I'd be a nervous wreck. But no, I, th I feel, I mean, obviously it's a new seat. Oh no. 
I'm, I always get locked in this corridor as well. I always get locked in this corridor. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm <laughs> you dick. I always get, uh, no, I'm, I'm so much more relaxed. Now, to be fair, I will start to get a little bit, because it's 45 minutes to go. I usually come down like a quarter of an hour to go. And then there's a little bit of tension in the studio, but tonight we've got to film this thing for an opera. If you just said to me 10 years ago I'd be in an opera, I'd have said, nah, it's not, no, that's not going to work, is it? Particularly, it's particularly... You, you, no, it's all right, don't worry, don't just go ahead, just go ahead. Yeah, just go ahead. Just go ahead. Let's ruin it. I'm just pre-recording, so if you wouldn't mind just being quiet for two minutes. It's not a strong point. <laughs> Five seconds. Four, three, two, one, zero. On air. We're on air, everyone. Have a cracker. Does that raise the stakes for Liverpool? I mean, it's ridiculous to think that we're actually asking that question. The crowd's right on top here, and certainly with an evening game, we know what the atmosphere will be like tonight. He's live with that Elliot. Yes! There it is! Yes! Oh, God. We're going to shock the world! Oh, what happened there? Oh! What was it we were saying about surprises in this Premier League? Relax, Trent. Penalty! Oh! What are you doing? This could be the greatest overlap ever. <laughs> the greatest overlap of all time. We've got in our hands here. This could finish the overlap off. Could be no more overlap. Underlap. Gary, thank you very much. Jamie, thank you. Bye from us. That's a wrap. Thanks, everyone. So, that's it for this episode of The Overlap. We're out of here and hit subscribe.